Hey, Megan. Campbell. <laughs> oh my God. We are not so at the funny. same time. Look at us. Look at us. You have, who would have thought? Not me. Not, not I. How are you frog. doing today? I'm doing pretty good. I've been having a really chill day, honestly. Um, I've been hmm. playing a lot of Stardew Valley. Love it. Love it for me. How uh, about you? Who, who, who do you romance in that? I've never okay. played Stardew Valley, but I see a lot of discourse about it. So, I'm a little hoe, and uh, there are 10 single people. I'm currently romancing all of them. Uh, <laughs> my goal is to give them all bouquets so I can start dating all of them. And supposedly, there is a special event that happens if you enter the saloon uh, on a Friday night while you're dating every single person in the town. <laughs> Oh, so I'm fun. waiting. I'm waiting to see when that happens. But I have to. I have a few more people. I need to get up to eight hearts first. I'm almost there. Yeah. I'm proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. Love being a hoe. <laughs> How's your paper going? Um, I finished it. Ah, love that for you. Uh, listeners, if you are in the STEM fields, learning like uh, maybe in college, and you're like, "This is for me," because I'm a math person. I'm a science person. I'm not like in a writing an English person or a history person. Don't let anything fool you. You need to write <laughs> and you need to practice starting Correct. now. Because then you'll spend five some years in grad school. And if you're continuing your research in academia, all you do is write. Yes. That's all you do. And Correct. so the uh, paper I was working on for my PhD work, uh, I've been doing like after I get off my current job slash weekends, it, uh, it's been accepted with major revisions Major revisions are due next Tuesday. As of, um, I worked on that, I think, from about 5.30 a.m. to, like, 10 a.m. today. Oh, my gosh. Um, at that point, You're a trooper. major revisions are completed. Nice. And good to go. And then I had to get all this stuff for this drink. Also had a shower. Yeah. Ran some more errands. Don't have any food in the house. Good now. Came back. Then I started the wonderful musical that we'll get to in just a second. In just a second. But now it is time for our favorite segment. Mm -hmm. What's it called? Phantom, Phantom of the Glossary. Ooh, I like that. I do too. Nice. So our term of the day is recitati. <laughs> recitati. Oh my God. Recitati. I'm trying to pronounce it right. Mm -hmm. But it's a style of vocal music and operas that kind of follows just rhythms and pitches of ordinary speech. So sing talking, which I feel like we've been talking a lot about a lot recently. Yeah. And so there's like the syllabic seco version or like the dry version um, that is usually used to advance action. But there's a, a more emotional version, a compagnato um, the company one that's with a company with a full orchestra um, that um, kind of swells up the dramatic tension, um, which normally leads to arias or like full ensemble pieces. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. And that is related to the musical I chose for today, Boo -doo 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 -doo. Phantom of the Opera, specifically yes. the 2004 film version which I know a lot of people have a lot of thoughts about, mm -hmm. but this is the version that we had access to watch. And fun fact, I've never seen Phantom of the Opera before. I always forget about that. I watched it a lot as a kid because uh, my sister loved it. And I uh, admittedly never really, I didn't, I never hated it, I would say, but I never, the 2004 film musical. No, no, um, which sister? Oh, uh, my middle yeah, sister. Um, yeah, I I never liked it that much as a kid, but watching it again now, I really, really enjoyed it on this watch through. I'm quite excited to talk about it. I'm excited to talk about it too, and how stupid I think so many decisions are oh, yes. made by the characters. Yes. Um, but yeah, yeah, we'll get into it. But with that, when I was thinking One about... One of the coolest oh, drinks we've had. What, oh, yeah, I hope so. I haven't tried it yet. Um, because listeners, I've been tr just raw dogging these cocktail <laughs> recipes. Um, I have like an idea for something. I was like, that may be cool together. I hope it works out. Still yeah. don't know. 
but I was thinking for Fan of the Opera, what should we have? Originally, I was thinking like some sort of like mold wine. I was thinking mm. something like a deep red color. Yeah. As someone who like has only listened to the music, not even all the music, and not the the most I knew about Fan of the Opera was actually the Disney Channel original movie, Phantom of the Megaplex, or that one. Um, American Dad episode, Phantom of the Telethon, where Roger is the Phantom of the Telethon. That's and it, yeah, and that's my experience with the plot. But I wanted something with a deep red color, and I decided with, because this is a very classic musical, mm-hmm. to go with a variation of an old fashion. And with that, it is, it has like uh, black cherry juice. Mm-hmm. Um, it has a cracked black pepper simple syrup some orange zest um other typical old-fashioned ingredients um but we also using white chocolate made masks yes for the phantom um as like a really fun topper for the drink and i'm really excited i'm very excited to try this um so should we take a sip first and then like a bite of the mask or what what should be the pim das for this i think i think yeah sip of the drink and then follow with the bite of the of the mask and then we'll name it okay Uh, cheers cheers. oh that's so good the pepper is very subtle it is i really like it i think like the cherry really complements the like you still get that old-fashioned flavor and scents mm-hmm. because at the end of the day you have you know whiskey sugar and bitters and orange orange flavor the orange zest like gives you that like nice aromatic that you always get from an old-fashioned mm-hmm. but then the With cherry the aromatic bitters <laughs> yeah and then the cherry and the pepper together oh it's that perfect balance of like sweetness and like a little bit of darkness with like like not quite spice but like a, like the teensiest bit mm-hmm. of like hint yeah 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 at the end I, I really like this. I like this too. I Way to follow your this gut. Is, this, this is a good drink for people that may not necessarily like whiskey. Because the cherry yeah. juice does like, I mean, it's a strong flavor. Yeah, I agree. Uh, let's, let's, let's name this. I was thinking the Masquerade. The Masquerade, I think, is good. I was thinking something like Black Rose, but I don't know if that's, what's the word? Cheesy is not the word, but along those lines. Cool. Um, Yeah, that works. I like Masquerade. Cool, let's do it then. Okay. Yeah, (laughs) I can't think of anything else. Yeah. And so, uh, fan of the opera, uh, specifically, uh, this is the 2004 film, which is based on Andrew Lloyd Webber, musical the same name, which is based on Gaston LaRose's novel, the same name, Mm -hmm. uh, same name. Uh, this was produced and co-written by Andrew Lloyd Webber and directed by Joel Schumacher. Um, and the film was like originally announced in 1989, but production actually didn't start till 2002 um, because of a lot of things. Like uh, Schumacher's like busy career, and Joel Lloyd Webber was going through a divorce. Um, and it was so there was like a lot, it was very highly anticipated as being such a staple. Um, of musicals mm-hmm. um, the because the Phantom of the Opera musical um, opened in London's Weston in 1986 and on Broadway in 1988 um, and then the book was actually by Gaston, Gaston Leroux um, was published uh, in 1909 as like a serial like in like kind of like a magazine type thing um, but was released in like a volume form in 19 19- um, which and it's loosely inspired um, by historical events at the Par- Paris Opera during the 19th century, um, concerning a like a story of a former ballet uh, pupil skeleton, uh, Carl Maria von Weber's 1841 production of Der uh, Freischutz. But this is like one of the I think most well known musicals yeah for sure um it's been incredibly popular um been referenced and performed many times um and i think like this is this is one of those that a lot of times like regardless of i think how people feel about the musical itself 
I think this is one of those musicals that definitely made, has definitely made a huge cultural impact mm-hmm. um, on musical theater and people that like musical theater, regardless of their thoughts on this particular film adaptation. Um, which I think can be said about a culture. lot of Andrew Lloyd Webber's works. Um. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. Fan of the opera. Fan of the opera. Shall we get into it? Yeah. Okay. So we open on a photo of the People's Opera House in Paris in 1919. Um, everything's in black and white at first. Because uh, it's old. Because it's old, yes. But it's, but it's more modern than everything else in color. Listen, but like, but we're transported back to that time, so we're actually there in the 1800s, which is why it's so in the color. Future but the is 1919, black and white. 1919, we're seeing on film, and that's why it's in black and white. Boom. Okay, lawyered. Okay, yeah, Done. there Bird you go. Um, <laughs> so there's an auction going on um, of all the houses, like items, like all the furniture, all that stuff. Um, and one of the it doesn't I- look great. It doesn't look great. It's, like, destroyed, uh, all the inside wrecked. Um, So there is an auction, or I just said that. Um, One of the items is a music box with a monkey on top um, that ends up being purchased by a very old man that we see who is the Vicomte de Chagny. Um, So many times when they said anyone's name, I'm just, like, roll my eyes thinking about (laughs) you. (laughs) Because I was just like, okay, calm down. Um, who is other, uh, no, none other than Raoul, um, who we uh, basically becomes one of our main like love interests um, mm-hmm. in the film. Played by Patrick Wilson. Yes, um, so good. Also, fun fact, because I've never seen this movie. I didn't know anyone who was in it. I, I never, I, I just didn't have that knowledge in my yeah. brain. I was so shocked to see so like so many people in this. Yeah. I was like, you were in Phantom of the Opera? <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. Um yeah, Patrick Wilson being one of those people crushed it. Mm-hmm. I he think he's so, so good. Um so Patrick Wilson, born in Norfolk, fun fact. Ooh, that's cool. Yeah. Um he's been in so many things. Um he was nominated for Best Actor in a musical for the Full Monty. Um, he's had a Drama League Award for Fascinating Rhythm, a, a Drama Drama League Award for Bright Lights, Big City. Um, he was on national tours of Carousel uh, and Miss Saigon. Um, more regionally, he was in Sweet Bird of Youth and Side of House Roll, uh, Rules and Romeo and Juliet, The Musical, Lucky in the Rain, Harmony, The Full Monty, um, At the Globe. But what I know him from is all of the horror movies, just all of them. In Annabelle, Fair. Insidious, mm-hmm. The Conjuring. He's all of them because he is one of the, like, experts. And isn't it wild to go from seeing him, at, like, only in horror movies to then seeing him in, like, Phantom of the Opera? And you're like, you can sing? Which is well? a musical horror movie. That Repo the Genetic, genetic, genetic opera, opera wishes it could, it could be. be. I, I, I thought about Repo the Genetic Opera a couple times during this. Um, but yeah, Patrick Wilson, incredible. He does so a great job. Crushed it. Yeah. Um, so then, uh, they move on to the auction of the chandelier and the auctioneer begins to give us some of the history of this opera house and the chandelier specifically. Um, and as they unveil it, we hear the organ Ooh, and we go into classic organ. So good. Um, and we go into the overture. Fun fact about the chandelier. Uh, it weighed about 2.2 tons. That's crazy. It cost $1.3 million and was provided by Swarovski, like the crystals. Yeah. It had, it, the chandelier had its own stunt double. Honestly, that makes a lot of sense. There was also, like, the chandelier that we see here was actually the third that was made that was equipped with electricity and lighting for the opening scene. That's crazy. That's, that's really cool, so though. cool. Yeah. In it's really interesting to learn about the props. 2004 as well. Or yeah. 2005? I don't know. Two, uh, yeah, 2004. Really the sure. early aughts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so we hear the organ and we're transported back to the sort of opera's heyday. Um, and the organ at the beginning of this overture. So this is the this is the typical, like, fan of the opera. Like, do, 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 do. Um, right. And it hits... 
so fucking hard mm-hmm. every time. Like, it really oh does. my There's gosh. something so powerful. Yes. I think, and I don't know if this is a hot take, there is something so powerful to me mm-hmm. of a chromatic scale. Oh, yeah. Hell yeah. Because it is two extremes. One extreme exhibited by this musical is like a harsh kind of some a lot of times dissonant with like background chords because, you know, you're playing all the semitones in a row. And on the other side of the spectrum, um, circus clowns. <laughs> yeah. Because March of the Clowns is just a chromatic scale. Mm-hmm. There's, it's either dark or whimsical. Yeah. And there's never an in-between. The in between might be uh, one of Whitney Houston's riffs. Kind of does a chromatic moment, um, and uh, I'm every woman. Oh yeah. The, uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I guess that's the middle point. Every woman. So, so that's that's the full spectrum of the chromatic scale, and it's always powerful. It's always and powerful. It, it always I hits. I love it. And I also think there's just something really powerful and like catchy about just starting a piece with this level of intensity. Like it makes me think of um, Beethoven's the Symphony Number no. Nine, the famous one, the bum 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 bum. Mm-hmm. Um, and I I think there's just like when when you just start off with that level of intensity, it's just going to stick in your head. Um, and the way like I really like how this um, this piece like this this melody in general, but this piece has sort of like light rock opera vibes. Every all of the Phantoms music has like light rock opera styling. Because he's edgy. He's, he's edgy. Misunderstood. <laughs> he's dark. <laughs> he's, he's not a, like other guys. <laughs> he's a groomer. <laughs> he's a groomer. <laughs> um, and it's it's Hashtag it's not like us. And I say, because I don't know if this is the technical musical term, but I, I'm calling it light rock opera because it's still using um, a lot of like string instruments. It's still using like that organ, um, but it has like that drum beat backing. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't have like any electric guitars or anything, but the instruments are almost exhibiting that feeling um, that you would get from like a full rock opera sound. And I, I really like the way it, both gives the Phantom his own distinct musical style in this. Um, But I also think it's integrated in a way that, to me, doesn't necessarily feel anachronistic. But we're going to talk about that, because that's kind of what my discussion question is about. I'm interested to get your thoughts on it. Mm -hmm. So um, we go back, we're transported to the opera's heyday. They are prepping for a performance that evening. Um, and we see Raul on his way to the... Okay, so I say Raul because that's the way his name is spelled. But Christine calls him just kind of like Raul. 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 So Raul. I don't... I don't know. Raul. But Raul is on... <laughs> Raul. Raul. <laughs> Raul is on his way to the opera house. Um, and we learned that uh, two men have recently bought the opera house because the current manager is retiring. Um, mm-hmm. And Raul is their new patron. So the two men that have bought the opera house, uh, we have Andre, played by Simon Callow, who has been in a musical we've done recently. What was Lord. he in? Oh, Lord. There's a few um, movies, actually. Can I get a clue or a hint? Um, I chose it. Okay. This calendar year. Mm, was it James and the Giant Peach? It was. He was the grasshopper. His voice sounded kind of familiar. I yeah, mean, cool. so Simon Callow, Four Weddings of the Funeral, Shakespeare in Love, James and the Giant Peach, Chance of a Million, and then the other Fearman, um, played by uh, Kieran Hines, was also in a musical we've done. Oh, Lord. Uh, hint. I, I'm going to need a hint. I'm always going to need you a were, hint. You, you drink a lot. Oh, yikes. Was it Frozen 2? It was Frozen 2. <laughs> so he was Pabby, also the grandpa in Frozen 2. Okay. Um, uh, but he's also been in Belfast, and he was also in Harry Potter. He was uh, Abba Firth, Dumbledore. Oh, that's cool. Nice. Um, um, but, like, as they're, you know, entering, kind of discussing things, we see they're in the middle of a rehearsal right now, and we start to see, like, different characters. We see Christine, mm-hmm. um, our main character, play, and I had no idea Emmy Rossum was in this, which blew my mind. Um, because I love Shapeless. I had never seen it. 
I've only, as far as Shameless I know, I only show. know her from this. It's her. Show. She's also been in the day after the tomorrow. Fun fact: she was also in Dragon Ball Evolution, the horrible live action version of Dragon Ball Z. I think that's the only Dragon Ball I've seen. She so she plays Bulma, which is funny because her like I think my favorite love interest of her and in Shameless, um, Justin Chatwin, played Goku. Mm. Isn't that fun? But cool. Emmy Rossum, who was very young when this first was filmed when they started she filming, looked she was 16 that's crazy um we also see like another like member of the supporting cast at the time um meg uh meg jerry um played by jennifer allison who's also been brookside the college we also see uh her mother uh madame jerry yeah who is the kind of leads the dancers um, is played by Miranda Richardson, who's also been in Sleepy Hollow, Good Omens. Um, she was she also was in Good Omens. I thought she looked familiar. Okay. Yeah, she also should be familiar because she is also from another musical that we have done on the podcast. Your hint is you chose it. Was it Brandy Cinderella? No, mm. it was animated. Could it have been a Barbie movie? No, way worse. Oh no! Oh, was it? Was it uh, the King and I? Yeah, she played uh, Anna. Mm. Leon Owens, uh, but she's also Rita Skeeter in oh, the Harry Potter movies. That's fun. Um, and then we also see uh, Carlotta, um, mm-hmm. who so much fun. She's so fun. She's so over the top the entire movie. Yeah, Minnie Driver crushed it. Yeah. Also been The Riches, Goodwill Hunting, Speechless, Peter Pan Live. She was also in Princess Mononoke. Uh, and we also see Pianji, uh, who's played by Victor McGuire, who's been in Kate and Koji, Bread, Coronation Street. Um, but the uh, rehearsal is currently going on for a not real opera yeah. uh, called Hannibal. And the song specifically they're rehearsing is Hannibal Comes. Mm-hmm. Um, originally, Andrew Lloyd Webber meant this as kind of like a warm up and kind of like to have, like kind of like a laugh to like have fun in like such crazy um, makeup and outfits. costumes and story and yeah, yeah. I really like the little clips we get of um, the shows that they're practicing or rehearsing or performing at the opera house. Those always very fun and. Every single one of them looks like I would go see that show. Like that yeah. looks like a, that looks like a fun time. Um, yeah, so I love. Uh, so they're rehearsing the song, and of course, like so they've introduced the new owners. Um, and so she's like trying to because impress them. The trying original to... owner is retiring <laughs> for his health. The Fever, played by James Fleet. Right, for, great timing. Yes, fantastic timing. Um, so uh, during their rehearsal of Hannibal comes. Uh, Carlotta is singing straight at the new owners, like staring them down with a frightening intensity <laughs> that I don't appreciate. Um, and so eventually she says, oh, I'm not singing tonight um, because y'all basically don't know how to treat me. Um, and so Lefebvre, Lefebvre tells Where are my me, dogs? <laughs> literally, bring me my dog. Um, so Lefebvre tells the new managers to grovel to her and they basically like you know, start heaping her with praise and beg her to sing for them. And so she starts singing Think of Me, which is the aria from, like, the show that they're going to be presumably performing that night. Mm-hmm. And so... Um, yeah, the my show is just like, just do it. Just I'll just, follow just along. I'll do whatever you want. Uh, played by uh, Marie Melvin, who's also been in Star, the Star Hunter and then, like, the sequel series, Star Hunter's Re- uh, Redux, uh, Oscar's Orchestra. He was, I think, a silent hero in and he was it fun. Really he, had, he had good comedic timing, too. Made me miss, like, playing in an orchestra pit. Really? Yeah, I can see that for you. Because I think this was some of the... I mean, I played in so many different types of ensembles in, like, mm-hmm. high school. Like, I was in concert band. I was in jazz band. I was in marching band. I was in indoor drum line. I did the orchestra pit. That's fun. I, I did a lot. Yeah. And the, I think the orchestra pit was one of my favorites. That's cool. Um... So yeah, so we get into Think of Me, and 
Carlotta's is very overly theatrical. She's it's it's technically very good. Like all like all of it's her like riffs an and evil stuff are very good. Step sister's version of it. Yeah, yeah, very much trying to like show very off. Lucy very much, punch. yeah, very much just like singing all over the place. Um, not really a, a true emotional core to the song. Um, and while she's singing, a rope is mysteriously untied amongst the or amidst the rafters, and a beam. Um, like falls down and nearly falls on her while it was like a backdrop, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like the uh, like there's like a canvas or something that is attached to the beam. Yeah, um, and so that falls falls down, almost falls on her while she's singing. Um, we can presume that this is the Phantom of the Opera who's uh, responsible for this. Um, he drops a note onto the stage. And at this point, Carlotta freaks out and, like, leaves for real. And she's like, I'm actually not singing now. I'm not performing now. Because you can't keep us safe. Um, so then they're freaking out. They're like, well, who's going to sing? Um, and Madame Giri says, well, Christine can do it. She's been trained by the very best. She can definitely sing the song. And so then Christine starts singing Think of Me and actually finishes out the song. And I really like how hers is, uh, like, very tender and gentle. And it feels much more like someone actually singing this to their loved one. Um, yeah. Because yeah. she also sees that Raul um, is the new kind of... She's the money for this operation now. Yes. But was also her childhood friend. hmm So it's kind of in the way that she's, like, speaking to him. hmm Yeah. So very, much more emotionally tied, and she is glowing. Ah. Uh. When she's, she's singing so this, and it transitions to the actual performance. Yeah. Night. Yeah. Um, and so he recognizes her while she's performing on stage. And I love his voice, too. It's just so rich. Um, and uh, when their voices... It doesn't happen in this song. When their voices blend together, it's so beautiful. Yeah. Um, and then she has this ending riff at the end of the song when she's singing, like, the final, like, Think of Me. And... It's so good. I just, I can't recreate it, obviously. But like, if you haven't heard the song, I will not. I won't make you. Um, you. If you haven't heard the song, (laughs) go listen to it. It's fantastic. (laughs) Um, So then uh, Madame Giri reads the note that the Phantom left. And it says to uh, always leave box five empty for him um, anytime there's a show being performed and to give him his salary because it's apparently very far behind. And I don't think they say, I don't recall if they say say how much it is. I think it's like in the thousands of francs though, like 20,000 20, 20, francs is what they said. Um, which apparently is quite a lot of money to them. And they're just like, absolutely not. Who even is this guy? Do we even know he's real? Like, what? Which is like, he's leaving. I mean, he's leaving physical evidence, but someone else could be forging that. So I guess technically you still don't know. Um, so yeah, so they basically ignore this shit and they're just like, this is weird. We're not going to buy into your random superstitions. Um, and they would come to regret that. So then Christine is off on her own after the show. Um, and we hear like echoes of the phantom's voice, like calling to her, congratulating her for doing a good job. And, um, Meg comes to find her and basically like asks, you know, like, how did you, um, get to good singing? Like, how did you learn? Like, how did you learn that talent? Like, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, Christine starts to tell her of her angel of music who her father would prom- who her father promised would come to her um, after his death and basically guide her and, and help her to become a, a good and prominent musician. Yeah. And during the song, song, Angel of Music. <laughs> angel of Music. Um, I really like this melody. I think their voices are just very beautiful together. Um, and I think this song is one of many in this musical that has symbol is not the right word but it's it's like like one of those slow melodies that like like classic sounding melodies that sounds simple um but is very like sort of lilting and like sentimental and just like mm, i can't think of the right word but um just very Um, uh, orally pleasing i guess it's a very specific type of like bird song 
Mm, yeah. That has that kind of like, it's a full voice, but like the, how it's like composed, there's a hollowness to it. Yeah. Which is two contradicting things, but. Actually, yeah, it's like, you, it's like bird bones. I was going to say you saying that um, makes me realize that a lot of Christine's singing, especially like in Think of Me, um, but like her solo singing does remind me of Joanna. I, and yeah, Sweeney exactly. Todd. Yeah. And I will say um, Ra- Raul's uh, singing reminds me of the song Joanna. Joanna. As well. I get that. I totally get that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, Madame Meg Gio- doesn't believe her. Yeah, she doesn't believe but her. But her mom says to Christine, he is pleased with you. Yeah. So, uh, oh. Madame Giri meets Christine in her dressing room, which is filled with roses from her performance. Raoul comes to see her and tells her, you, you did so good. Like we should like reconnect and blah, blah, blah. And like, you should come out with me. Um, and she tells him about her angel of music and says, he's very strict. I can't do that. Immediate yikes, immediate Crazy. red flag. What's going on? What do you mean? Um, why is this presumably opera ghost controlling your movements and behavior and life concerning? This, this, this was the first strike for me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you can't just leave. Well, no, she can't because Raul leaves and then we see a gloved hand lock her in her room um, while Madame Giri watches seemingly approvingly. Also red flag. Um, yeah, but yeah, that, so, so that's after the song Little Lottie where they're just like, oh, remember yeah. us being kids? Um, so Raul leaves, she's locked in her room and then she ventures. Yes, she uh, uh, kind of goes to stand in front of the mirror and we hear um, the voice of the phantom again, and we get into the song, The Mirror, parentheses, Angel of Music. Um, so much creep factor. Uh, only softened by how good their performances are. Um, which at this point in the musical, I did think, uh, so this is the first time that we see Phantom of the Opera, who is played by... Gerard Butler. Shocking. Crazy. Yeah. 300. Wild. Law Abiding Citizen. Um, How to Train Your Dragon movies. Uh, I mean, a million. It's Gerard Butler. It's Gerard Butler. So then we get into, we kind of merge from the mirror into the Phantom of the Opera. Because she's like being drugged. There's so much yeah. smoke. There's <laughs> like. He's dragging her first, through this I was tunnel. Like, Did she, I, at first I was like, is he magic? Is she walking through a, a mirror? I really liked in the parts that were basically just Angel of Music. They're, yeah. They're, it's the same. Yeah, um, it's all the same. When he's whispering and the singing is overlaid. Mm-hmm. That's fair. I think that was I really, like that. Really I like that cool. effect. Yeah. Um, and then the secret hallway, and it was getting a little, like you were saying before, a little more like rock opera when we were yeah. getting into a fan of the opera. Yeah, and I really like um, their costuming in this scene. So he's wearing this like really dark suit with like reds and, and browns. Um, like furs underneath um but like his actual suit is black and then he has a cape over it and it just gives him this very like dark look um but then she's in this like white lace that's like fully almost sheer on the bottom um but she's wearing like stockings and stuff under that and it gives them this like dark gothic um wedding like bride and groom look um that's very much like young ingenue being kidnapped uh, by old groomer man who's Which probably taking her to his lair to kill her. <laughs> because that's exactly what happens. Yes, correct. Um, <laughs> yeah, this song also slaps. I like most of the songs in this musical. Um, so, we, yeah, we get to the light, the, the actual layer, um, his sweet music tune, which I think is like a lyric that goes so hard. Yeah. And we get into the music of the night. This is the music of the night. <laughs> <laughs> the music of the night is easily my favorite song in um, the musical. It's not my favorite song. I liked Fair it enough. a lot to the point where I was like, okay, this song needs to be over. Really? I yeah. There's just something about... I think because in a way, this melody... No, it doesn't remind me of the... It doesn't remind me of the Great Gate of Kiev. Um, but there's something about the slowness and intensity with which it's played that like the 
energy of it reminds me of that piece and the way it like slowly builds um until when you get to the end especially like when he hits that high note on let your spirit start to soar it just it it gets me every single time i just really like the way it just slowly builds on itself and how slow and almost like taunting the melody is um yeah i i really like this Um, i also think this song is a great use of dynamic absolutely like absolutely first and foremost i like wrote down i was i wrote down good use of dynamics which yeah. is such a nerdy thing to write down <laughs> but it is but an apropos thing yeah the, okay and i think the song is good until he starts like groping her yeah um in his defense she's fucking hot in this scene truly an incel's wet dream she was 16 right now did you not hear me say truly an incel's wet dream? What a, yeah, what part? <laughs> um, and I, like at, at those kinds of parts, I was like, I think this song could have ended because they, I feel like in a lot of these songs, they make their point in the very beginning and they just repeat it for the rest of the song. That's fair. That's fair. Which like sometimes, like I think it's fun, whatever. For this one, I was like, okay, let's like move it along. And then this is also the end of a chain of like four songs, like almost yeah. completely back to back. So it I just like the fan of the opera is not an opera, but there's a lot of opera style songs. In it. Yeah. And operas are just like you just you're just going for it. Yeah. Yeah. There's not a lot of break. Correct. <laughs> it's like so, almost a song through musical, but not. Yeah. Yeah. Um but so he then shows... she sees she's like walking around she's like ooh cool spooky layer um, and then she sees a mannequin of herself in a wedding dress and fits. very creepy yeah very fair reaction passes out uh, in totally this normal cool reaction. bird bed yeah this was really cool I would that absolutely has its love own, to sleep like, in this curtain that's like sandbagged yeah because it was like a slow like release. Mm-hmm. It was, it was very cool. nice. And, like, the the bedding was all, like, nice and velvety. Would love that. Um, so we see Meg in Christine's room and, like, yes. sees, like, the mirror is a door. So I was like, oh, okay. So he's not magic at that point. Yeah, um, it's, like, actually f- physical. She discovers the tunnel, um, starts to go down it, but then her mom finds her and kind of drags her out. And then we kind of see, like, the main stagehand, Bouquet, uh, like, kind of being, like, super creepy with all the women. Yeah. Um, played by Kevin McNally, who's been in Turn Washington Spies. Um, he was uh, in London, like in the West End. Um, he was Alan Ben opposite, like Maggie Smith in The Lady in the Van, um, opposite Julia Binoche in Naked, but he was also in like all the Pirates of the Caribbean. He was Gibbs. Mm. I was, I thought this was like an interesting scene. So this scene right here is also an interesting bit of foreshadowing because uh, Madame Jerry like puts Baquet in his place by yeah. tying a noose around his neck. Yes, which is a little spoiler coming up for something coming up. A soon. little fun spoiler. A little fun spoiler. So then um, Christine wakes up. And she sees, uh, first she sees the monkey music box. So we like, find out like, oh, this is where that's from. And like later, like why it probably becomes so important to her. She finds the phantom and uh, kind of walks up, walks up to him. And like kind of before he can react, quickly takes his mask off to like be able to see his full face. And he goes absolutely berserk. Um, and his lines during the scene are hilarious. My favorite is, you little lying Delilah. Hey hilarious. There, Delilah. Fantastic. What you doing removing my mask? <laughs> Oh my gosh. Um, I really don't think, I don't know if it's just, (laughs) I don't know if it's just what they did in this particular show. I don't know what it's supposed to look like in the stage shows, but I feel like his face really doesn't look that bad. Like there's definitely, it doesn't, doesn't. a wig would solve (laughs) 90% of the issues with like like the ear and like the, 
kind of right here and like the it's it's the hair that's missing just yeah. wear a wig and you would be fine honestly it's really not that deep bro like i understand being insecure about it for sure but like you don't need to go this crazy over and, and i like, understand relax. like the main <laughs> thing is that you had like whatever condition and then you were literally beaten and enslaved literally and abused and yeah about it for like and like exploited entire, and commercialized yeah, for, like, years and that's where your problems arise but yeah I think it's a bad problem but like if we're like thinking about it it's not that big the actual deal. physical deformity is not crazy. also what is it in society about these pieces of fiction where it's always like a woman that has to tame the beast oh because we hate women yes oh my lord do you want to get another drink i do <laughs> this do. has gotten me heated i also have the ceiling <laughs> fan off so i am hot so yeah fair Ugh, another drink no more dose Kayla, do you remember being back in like third grade and having like music class and learning to play the recorder and like hot cross buns? Fun fact. So, you know, I know a lot of wind instruments. I physically was mm -hmm. not able to play the recorder. My teacher told me just to stand there at the concert. But yeah, I'm familiar with the concept. <laughs> that's so, wait, that's so, that's so sad. It's okay. I can play the bassoon. I've gotten over it. I don't feel bad about it. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll move on. Put a pin in that. Um, <laughs> Put, put a pin in that. Boop. Um, so, unfortunately enough, uh, there are students all across the country that have never before had a general music education class and don't have the ability or the opportunity to access music education um, and get the chance to learn tons of different wind instruments um, or even just the recorder. And that's why we are partnering with Education for Music, which is an organization that partners with low-income schools in New York City to provide students better access to music education. Also, 53% of New York City schools do not have a music teacher on faculty full-time. So Education for Music also provides weekly music education by putting qualified music teachers into these schools. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the reasons this is so important is because motivation for learning means motivation for staying in school. And a lot of the students that are able to be involved in these music programs report that they have uh, attended school when they otherwise would have skipped um, or like stayed in school when they otherwise like wouldn't have wanted to stay specifically because they were looking forward to music class or they were looking forward to ensemble um, and, and getting to learn uh, specifically about music. And you can support and learn more at etmonline.org slash donate. That's etmonline.org slash donate. And help out. Do you have an instrument that you've neglected and now it hates you? Do you have too much money and think, hey, this can go to a good place? Neither applies to me, but I want to talk to you about the Dodario Foundation. They believe in the transformative power of music and that mentoring and building communities through music can positively affect social change. 100% of every dollar raised goes directly to support efforts to get kids involved in community music programs, acquire and maintain instruments, provide college scholarships, and support new innovation in music education. You can learn more and donate at www.dodariofoundation.org slash about slash donate. That's www.dodariofoundation.org slash about slash donate. Hey there, listeners. Pop quiz. Who was your favorite teacher in school? Did it happen to be someone who inspired a movie? Did that movie later change the world? Because that's exactly what happened with Mr. Holland's opus, the story of the profound effect a dedicated music teacher had on generations of students. The composer for the film, Michael Kamen, later started the Mr. Holland's Opus Foundation in 1996 as his commitment to the future of music education. Today, the foundation works with schools nationwide to audit their music education programs, supply quality instruments, train teachers on basic instrument repair, and even offer customized consulting to make sure the school's program fits their students' needs. The impact of this foundation now ensures that hundreds of thousands of kids across the country are granted access to learn and play music in school, keeping music education alive and well. If you're interested in supporting their mission, you can donate online, over the phone, or even while you shop Amazon or eBay. Visit mhopus.org slash donate to learn more. Me, 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 Cheers. Me. Cheers. Oh, I like that. I reduced yes. the amount of cherry juice and added, uh, doubled the amount of uh, pepper syrup. So good. I really liked it. I just made a mocktail version, 
So instead of whiskey and not adding bitters, you add some ginger ale. Delicious. I can imagine. I would imagine that would be very good. So the Phantom uh, threatens to keep her trapped there, um, but ultimately decides to take her back because she... Is not a demon. Projecting. (laughs) Because she gives him the mask back, which is still like a million red flags. Mask off challenge. (laughs) Mask off challenge. Um, So then we're back at the opera house. We see Raul Present with day. the managers and uh, Carlotta. Well, like they all come into the scene at different times, but they're all freaking out about letters that they've gotten from the Phantom. Oh yeah, but no, no. But right before that, it's that oh, weird okay. transition that it's easily missed that they're back in present day. That he has the music box and he's in the carriage, looking yes. back. And then there was this weird mirror shot where she, where he sees. I assume Meg was the woman. I thought so, yeah, because she looked similar to Madame Giri, but would have been, it, she would be dead by then. So, yeah, I would assume it's Meg. Good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I hate it. You see in the, um, like, side mirror, mm. just like a perfect shot of her waiting at the dilapidated opera house. And it is too clean and too perfect. I was just like, this is jarring to me. And Interesting. Then you see, like his eye that's slightly colored that transitioned into seeing the the theater house again, and then we yeah. get into what we're getting into now. Yeah, yeah, fair, fair. Notes. Yeah, there are a lot of those little transitions like that. That, like, yeah, I don't know that it's super necessary for us to keep cutting back and forth. Um, but yeah, so they're all freaking out about letters that they got from the Phantom. Um, so he is requiring them to but cast. Not, some of them didn't even know it was from the Phantom. Yeah, that's revealed, like, during the scene, um, because Raul thinks that his letter came from the managers, and I think same for Car- Carlotta at first. Carlotta um, thought it came from Raul. That's right, yeah. Because it was, like, very complimentary of Christine. Yeah, um, and so he's requiring them to cast Christine as the Countess and Carlotta as the page boy in the <laughs> upcoming show that evening, which is funny because the page boy is a completely silent role, is the point. Yeah, and then we there's a lot of buzz around the opera house that like everyone knows that Christine is missing, and they're like, "This yeah. is two Sopranos that are like gone," but yeah. it's good publicity, so it's fine. Correct. Um, so Carlotta then freaks out again and tries to leave again, um, and she like rushes outside, and it's everyone outside is just like asking for Christine, just like, "Where's Miss Daye? Can you get this rose to Miss Daye?" Um, and so then the manager starts singing to her again to like placate her and we get into the song prima donna i thought um, this, this was my favorite song interesting i didn't have I any questions so the song. i liked it fine but fun i thought it was a very different tonal shift in the music definitely obviously. yeah um and i think this is there was a in this song there was a lot when other characters had like different interjections there was different like musical motifs that were going yeah. on at the same time but it didn't feel like playing two songs at once. I get that. Yeah. And I just really like Carlotta. <laughs> That's fair. The energy of the song is definitely very fun. Um, I really like the way the manager's voices meld together. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a little portion. Um, I was calling it like a rondo because like it's the type of music that it reminded me of. I don't know if that's the appropriate musical term. Um, but there's a bit where the managers are like singing sort of backing to Carlotta as she's getting ready and she's singing this like operatic style like prima donna refrain over it and then they're singing this like staccato kind of like yeah. quick um almost powder song style but not quite that fast um but it's just like really cool rhythm i really like it yeah yeah um, um so they're performing and so she is the starring role and yes. christine is the page boy yes. um bouquet is kind of spying around um and we see the phantom come upstairs and kind of like warns it was like hey i told you to keep that box open for me you ignored me i told you no and then this is also when we see the scene where the um throat spray is removed Mm. um so bouquet is following the phantom um carlotta is croaking (laughs) literally like i thought it was poison but she's just like she's fine which honestly worse 
ruined her reputation, say, ruined her were, performance. Like, they they were apologizing. They're like, we'll continue in ten minutes. They're here's like ballet the ballet from Act Two, like right now, mm-hmm. orchestra pit, like keep on going. I will say, people are having a great time. I don't think I think they're fine. I wasn't yeah. laughing. People like literally look so entertained. Because this is also one of those things that I was like, honestly, something this chaotic happening at like a musical theater show would be one of the funnest things. It would be so, it would be so interesting. Like, like um, so yeah, yeah, the audience seemed chill. They were like, fine. They were cool. <laughs> yeah. They, no one seemed angry. Or be yeah. like, I want my money back. They're just like, ah, ha, 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 ha. They're just like, what this is spectacle. interesting. <laughs> yeah. What a development. Um, yeah. And so then they are yeah, taken to the backstage to like replace Chris, or switch Christine and Carlotta. And in the middle of the ballet, um, the Phantom hangs Joseph from the rafters, which obviously causes a really big shock. Um, everyone is like freaking out, running away, like everyone's scattering. Christine and Raul end up finding each other and run to the roof together. Do you think, I was very curious why he did kill him. Do you Why think he killed that was, Joseph? Yeah. Do you think that was influenced by Madame Jerry? Oh, because of like him telling the story and stuff, like like him like talking about the Phantom earlier. That and like she obviously like puts him in his place. I don't know. I just don't trust her. I agree. Yeah. No. Like I I didn't know the express reason that he decided to kill Joseph. I didn't know. I couldn't tell if it was like. As a generic crazy. punishment. Yeah, I couldn't tell if it was a generic punishment for not following his instructions. Because that seems rude. Like, Joseph had nothing to do with that decision making. Um, or if it was specifically because of, like, Joseph, like, maybe seemingly mocking the Phantom, like, when he was doing his little bit earlier. Um, I don't know. Or maybe or maybe it could have been Madame Giri, and she was just like, listen, he's being a real creep around these girls. Um, but then the Phantom was a creep. So, again, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. The motive is not clear to me. Um, yeah, but then... I don't know. The, mo- the motive was confusing here. But yeah, yeah. They, uh, Raul and Christine escape to the roof. Yes. And... We get into, they start singing. So like they're kind of talking to each other. Originally they're starting off in like a Phantom of the Opera reprise, uh, which kind of goes a Why little bit Why have you brought a... me here? Yeah, which goes a little into the Music of the Night uh, reprise before they get into All I Ask of You. Um, which is probably my second favorite song. In this it's musical. great. It's really good. Um, we do see during the song that the Phantom is watching them from the shadow, so he's on the roof with them. When she's basically um, saying, like, he is, he, he's an uggo, he barely has a face, <laughs> but he has also really sad eyes. Yeah. <laughs> and then, like, she, like, drops, like, the road, like, that, that she made her. her choice. Yeah. And instead um, and, and of this using... person that's been stalking her place of business, it's the person she's known her entire life, her confidant. Yeah. Which the um, fandom cannot get. <laughs> he cannot get, yeah. And I, I really like, um, this is one of the first times I think we really hear Raul and Christine fully sing together. Yeah. And their voices just meld so beautifully. I think his voice, I think it's interesting how... Um, Raul and the Phantoms, not only voices, but also musical stylings kind of foil each other. Um, where, like I said, the Phantom is kind of marked by that like rock opera sound. His uh, A lot of his songs are very growly, very angsty. Um, he's very dark in them, whereas like Raul's um, voice really complements uh, Christine's. It's got, it's like, it's very rich, but it's also that smooth, um, like pure, like not quite classically trained in the same way um but still very like crisp clean sounding and just like soft and sentimental and tender um very much like kind of like the lyrics they're saying and what they both represent very day and night kid yeah kid cuddy where like in all i ask of you um let daylight dry your tears uh, that he's here to guard and guide her uh it's just like a direct opposition to um music of the night yeah and basically he will be he will be the light to block out the darkness of the phantom in he her is life. christ <laughs> yes <laughs> um and so really then they 
so then they kiss. Um, oh my Ooh. gosh! The, so they kiss, and then the note that they hit when they come back on anywhere you go, I will go to every single time. It gives me actual chills. Because they got business to do, and that's being fucking stunned. Oh my gosh! It just the the way it hits. It's just so beautiful and like strong and it just comes out of like nowhere it's, uh, it's beautiful I and then it. here's my next problem with this movie that she's like I don't feel safe when he's around things like that mm-hmm. so just leave he's <laughs> like I'll get my horses it's like okay just go now just leave just like literally go together walk out the theater and don't come back here yeah just, just, just not. leave <laughs> That should be their course of action, correct? Um, and then well, and they, they start go to downstairs, do that. and then we see the Phantom come, and he picks up yes. the betrayal rose. And <laughs> we get into a reprise of all I ask of you. Yes. Denied and me and betrayed me? You don't know her. He's an incel, Campbell. We've been over this. He was like, this guy just came along. It's like, no, they have a history together. They have a history together. Actually, since before, Which she you... knows him longer than she's known exactly. you. Exactly. It's like, and you don't know this. And like, you, yeah. you don't even, you don't even have, let, at least have all the information. Because do you actually know anything about her as a person, despite the, besides the fact that she can sing? He literally says he was bound to love you when he heard you sing. No, they know each other. Yes. They like, they have an actual other. connection with each other because they actually know each other as people. And then he, like, replays I, in his head Christina and Raul uh, singing. Singing together, yeah. And then you will curse the day you did not do all that the Phantom asked of you. Yikes. And then we get into that classic chromatic rift. Another red flag times a million. Yeah, like, he's sad, which means that everyone around him is in danger, basically. Um scary so then um we kind of fade away from that and we get into quick transition again in present day yes that's unnecessary (laughs) yes um and then we come back we yeah we come back basically into act two um and the managers we see are coming into a masquerade ball that they are throwing at the opera house and we get into the song Masquerade. I really love this song. Um, the overall sequence, like the, uh, is very showstopper almost. Like it's, you got the full company out. Everyone's like, everyone's costumes, very cool. And they're all color coordinated in a way that creates a very nice aesthetic um, splayed out across the stage. Um, and again, they have a, p- a part of this song that's like, staccato almost like pseudo acapella um where the music is kind of stripped down to a bit like more acoustic um they're breaking and it's it just, down it's just so fun it's just i really like this part uh, which is interesting because a, a lot of the dancing and the posing was referencing cats that's very interesting i could tell i not tell but i could see that like see that connection there um, and so and then I, I was confused. I was like, why are people so excited to be here? Someone literally just died. died. Um, but it was three months later and the fandom hasn't done anything. Yes. And because we did hear the managers when they were coming in, they were saying like, oh, it's great that the Phantom isn't invited tonight. So like they're fully like not expecting him to show up. Like they're thinking, yeah. you know, everything's good now. And um, we find out that Raul and Christine are secretly engaged. They are secretly and it's engaged. A secret, even though they're singing and making out on the dance floor. And making out in front of people. Yeah. So Raul doesn't want it to be masks? a secret. Why do Raul... they have masks? They think I don't they're know. better than a, don't like make a party any sense. team. Because um, that makes me mad. <laughs> of if you like, go, if there's a party and there's a theme, just like just do it. Put some effort in. Yeah. Do do something, you know. Okay. Um just out of respect for the person who put in all the effort to plan it, you know? So, yeah, Raul doesn't want them to be a secret, but we can see that she's wearing her engagement ring, like, on a chain around her neck. Um, she's, like, trying to keep him from kissing her in public, like, blah, blah, blah. Even though, like, they're literally standing in each other's arms. But whatever. Um, so, of course, the Phantom crashes the party. I don't know what they he expected. Looks so cool in red. <laughs> he does look really cool. Devil. It's, like, direct opposition of anyone <laughs> You mean your angle or your devil? <laughs> took the words out of my mouth. Um, and so he gives them instruction, like gives instructions to members of the cast. So he tells like, yeah. Carlotta, you need to learn how to act, basically. Um, the uh, dude who played Attila, not Attila, 
Hannibal. Um, yeah. <laughs> he like, said, like, to you need to lose weight. And Christine, um, he, like, snatches her engagement ring. It's basically like, you need to be with me, basically. Um, and then runs away. <laughs> what did you think of this song? So, so the song is Why So Silent. Um, and it's, we find out that he, like, yeah, he's instructing, giving his notes because he wrote this yeah. three-month opera. Um, why didn't everyone just fight him? So the many thought... times, I'm just like, <laughs> he killed someone. Yeah. Guards, it's, seize him. It's definitely one of those, like, if you all worked together, he's just one guy. You could definitely subdue him. But I think it's one of those, like, on shock factor things. Like, there are definitely people that, like, you are just kind of, like, shook by them when they show up. Especially if he sh- he does show up with a lot of, like, intensity and, like, star power. And I could see them being like, oh... I can't take him on type of thing or just being like a little starstruck not starstruck in the literal sense but like in shock maybe almost more, more of so what's going here's, on. here's a serial murderer and um, someone who's been threatening us for years but he has a certain je ne sais quoi so let's see how this plays out <laughs> literally he's got that razzle dazzle he's got he's that razzle dazzle <laughs> um, that's what you're saying and she uh, he also like says I'm her teacher by the way BT dubs yeah. Um, and he like vanishes in fire slash a trap door that I yeah. assumed he created. He's created a lot of trap doors in this opera house over the years. And then immediately though, Raul juts down. Yes. He's like, no, I'm going to act. And he like very fun house mirror, whatever's going on. And Madame Jury is right there. It's like, I'll show you the way. Like, I'll get yeah. you out of here. Yeah. She's a part of all this. She is, but she also kind of does help in them, like, getting Christine. I don't think she wants harm to come to Christine, but I do think she is a part of, like, supporting the Phantom's overall goals, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, So then, yeah, we get into a flashback from Madame Jury where she is basically telling Raoul about the first time that she met um, the Phantom. And she met him decades ago when she was a young girl. Um, and she went to a carnival with her ballet class, and he was on show as the quote unquote devil child, which carnivals in general are so fucked up. Oh my god! Um, but he, yeah. So this was where he was being like, severely abused, yeah, especially in this time. Oh my gosh, the eighteen hundreds were crazy. Um, so yes, yeah, so he was being severely abused by his keeper, um, and also just put on display as like a showpiece um and so he ended up killing his keeper and she helped him escape and presumably hide in the opera house which is where she was studying at the time so like we kind of find out about that backstory and like presumably all this time she's been supporting him helping him to stay hidden in this opera house and like she potentially kind of created this rumor of the phantom of the opera as like a way of like oh he's the ghost yeah. you know that just like lives in the rafters don't don't pay him any mind type of and thing and she's saying that like he's a genius he can do all these things but Raul's like well he has gone mad he can do a lot of things including murder ma'am oh uh, we need to and change then we're back that to pre- <laughs> then we're back to present day again yes i don't know why don't know why because the two seconds were back in the yeah. 1800s <laughs> <laughs> so then um we so then christine sneaks out yeah so then we see people are sleeping um it's kind of the middle of the night christine sneaks out to go to her father's grave and raul ends up like waking up while she's sneaking out and manages to follow her which ends up being for the best um but when she gets to she's dropped off at the cemetery and we get into the song wishing you were somehow here again and this is like the last of my top three, like, this is probably my third favorite song. This song is great. I really like the song. It's it's a very, like, classic sort of ballad, aria-esque type of song. Um, again, just, like, pleasant to the ear. And Amy Rossum's voice is just incomparable to me in this song. Like, not which is not to say that, like, there are no other singers as good as her. But, like, the quality of her voice and, like, the, the way she performs this. Like, I just think, like, her voice in particular is just so... I guess special in a way like it just it just sounds very distinct and I really like the way she sounds performing the song um and I almost got like something about the melody um there are parts of it in the song that almost give me like 
Anastasia vibes um, of like mm-hmm. parts of the melody remind me of the sequence um, of the da- what's it called dancing. Um, you th- you thinking dancing bears painted wings? Yes, uh, I, I can remember. Once upon a December. Once upon December. Yeah. Yeah, like it, the, the the melody parts of the melody of this song remind me of um, some of the sequences from that from that song in Anastasia. Um, and yeah, I just I just love this scene. It's so peaceful and serene. The I love that the cemetery is like snow covered. It, um, like the, the look like this, it sounds great, but the look of this is scene so beautiful. Was very impressive. I like really yes. really enjoyed it. Yeah, I I totally agree. Um, so then the phantom kind of comes out from where he was hiding. Um, we hear his again his voice kind of calling out to her from the shadows before he appears. And then before he's able to sort her, sort of lure her back into his embrace, Raul shows up and they start fighting. I think um, it's very interesting when he approaches because I like I'm I still get confused of what Christine thinks because you like from her father's grave, um, who has like this nice like mausoleum type thing because he's a like a world famous uh, violinist. Yeah, um, it's like the lights coming from within. I think. It's meant to be she believes this is, like, coming from, like, the soul of her father. Yes. In Wandering Child. And um, the the Phantom is saying, have you forgotten your angel? Uh, like, too long you've wandered, like, in the winter and stuff. Far from my fathering gaze. Mm. Creepy. Creep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this, it, it, this is where it really strikes me that, like, this is a story about a man who preyed on a young girl's literal just like loneliness and like grasping at any sense of connection and like guidance after her father died and like left her literally alone in the world um and it's just like i i see for her how especially given that like she was orphaned at like seven years old you know and presumably came straight to this opera house and so like i can see from her perspective how she kind of has this idea of him as the phantom entangled in this kind of hope almost for this angel of music that her father like really she just wants to like be with her father again she like she clearly had a very loving relationship with her father and wants that connection again and you can see her hope for that attachment leading her to then be fooled and taken in by the phantom who really just wants to groom her and kidnap her and in wishing you were somehow here again, I think that's like really evident as like that is her like that is her like weakness when she says too yeah. many years fighting back tears. Why can't the past just die? Yeah, because she she's like a she's a slave to it. Yeah, she's literally like entranced in many ways by his energy, by his presence, by his connection, by like his the riz. the hold he has over her. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, so then Raul, I think there should all... be more choreographed fights and blood in musicals. Oh, great. We've talked about that. There should always be more blood in musicals. Especially We've talked Justin about that Kelly. many times. That would have been so... It would, it would have made it so much better. <laughs> yeah. Just trampled. Um... And then, like, next scene, no injuries. <laughs> no injuries. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it just um... would have just leaned into how terrible it is. <laughs> so then Raul That sword almost... fight is so fucking cool. It it really is. It's such a it's such a high energy moment, especially at the at a point when like the musical is it, it's quite long. Um, and, and like so, the use of red in this musical is I think is done oh, really it's well. So good. With, like it's just like basically black and white with the snow and the cemetery, and then yeah. that red on the snow is very Kill Bill. Yes. Yeah. And, and it makes like, it that much more vibrant and impactful visually. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm just so like, then, good. Oh movie's over kill him right (laughs) this person is a serial murderer he is stalking your fiance he's just like vowing vengeance off of rooftops constantly literally killing random employees at the opera house a rapier with a skull hilt Mm -hmm. kill right here right now right here right now right here right now movie's over I was like, uh, there, there must be another 40 minutes of just them seeing how much in love they are. <laughs> sure. There really are another 40 minutes of this movie, which is crazy. Um, so yeah, so he doesn't no, kill him because Christine, like this. 
because like, Christine stops him, <laughs> which I get she has compassion for him. She has a little too much compassion. Don't listen so to her. Then, she's a child. She's a little child. Don't listen um, to her. Just marry her. <laughs> is his. So, so then, Raul, which they don't actually specify what their age difference is, which I they do, do find. No, but they do find out how old she is, though. Yes. 16. Yes, yeah. So then they return to the opera house, and Raul plots with the managers to basically like defeat slash capture the Phantom. Um, so they decide that they're going to put on this new show that he made that he wants Christine to star in. They're basically going to use Christine as bait um, and have like a bunch of guards and stuff there, like that Just worked do a last sweep time. Of the theater. Listen. Listen, there's like, so many ways you like, can resolve this. They're like, oh no, this is this is fine. We're just going to leave. And then the Phantom literally says, now let it be war upon you both. Yeah. Such a Which, sore like, loser. You didn't, yeah, okay, so cool. You didn't kill him. You could have arrested him then. You didn't have rope. Like, you didn't have anything to, a belt. You didn't have anything that you could just, like, tie him up or just, like, bring him back with you. Like, keep him restrained. You had you literally were standing over him with a weapon in your hands. At minimum, <laughs> someone should have ridden back on the horse, and someone should have taken the other like cab driver's horse, something, and carriage, back. something, something. Yeah, I agree. Um, so then they come up with this plan. Raul tells Christine um, that she's basically going to be bait, and she's this like, "I don't want to do that." This is heartbreaking. <laughs> so we're not, we have all been blind. Also saying that they're blind to like everything. Um, he's, she says, Raul, I'm frightened. Don't make me do this. Yeah. He'll take me. I know he won't let me go. Don't like, don't make me do this. Yeah. And he's like, yeah. no, I think this is the best. I think it'll be fine. This. I think, I think it'll, it'll be, be fine. fine. Yeah. You um, said he was nothing but a man. He's no concern. And so now they get to the actual performance of the opera that he's put on. And again, I gotta say, this is a show I would pay to watch. It seems very fun. I think this is really interesting. So this is the, it's Don Juan Triumphant. Um, and it's very, the audience doesn't like it. Yeah. And it's meant to be very different from traditional opera stages. So there's like a lot more sexualization. Yeah. Um, like especially it's like very passionate outfits. yeah um it's got a lot of like spanish like almost tango vibes just with the red and the black and like the flowers and the hair and the fire yeah and it's like the musical stylings is actually supposed to be a lot more modern so like this is like a don juan triumphant it's kind of like an adaptation of uh, of mozart's don giovanni mm -hmm. um which premiered in Prague in like the seven, late 1700s. And this is like, that's like more of a classical type thing, but it's a more modernized from a different perspective there. And it's really meant to show like his musical genius. Like no one in the audience gets it, but this is yeah. like the, where music is heading. I got gotcha. you. Oh, which I think is like a very interesting thing to do. So this is like the second fake opera in second or third fake opera in this musical yeah yeah it's fun that's that's interesting um so he uh we see that the phantom kind of like falls upon like one of the cast members backstage kind of like literally falls on him and presumably knocks him out takes his costume yeah, he, and and takes his place like in the show and which is like a plot point in the show yeah um and we get into the song the point of no return and loved it personally my first note is don't super care for this song but that's fine i don't think this song is like bad i i just don't really like this song very much i think this song is where the characters really let themselves like fall into it mm. like that's it's an fair act that turns into you're seeing some truth of emotions coming out from multiple characters that's fair especially and I think like that's it, just really cool to see within itself that's fair and like especially in the moment where he sings uh uh where he's singing to her and he sings her actual name he says christine i think in that moment it very much shows like he's so kind of caught up in the emotion of this that he's not even really acting anymore he's like Fucking actually yeah he's like actually giving his like real emotion um they es escape he runs off with her 
cuts the chandelier, crashes yeah. into the stage, yep. straight up kills Pianji, and then Char- uh, Carlotta says, my love to him. I was just like, I did not know they were in Where did that come from? I was yeah. just like, oh, that like was really upsetting. Um, and Raul is like going to chase after them. Madame Jerry's like, keep your hands at the level of your eyes. Yeah. That was a good line. Setting him up. Setting him up. Because um, that's what the Phantom says to him later when he's captured. It's like, oh, you thought this? Setting him up, I think. That's fair. Um, I did also think it was interesting at the very end of Point of No Return how the Phantom does like a short reprise directly to Christine of mm-hmm. All I Ask of You. And yeah. I, I kind of saw that as him like, Mocking is not quite the right word, but very clearly bringing back, like, I know you have this romance with Raul, and I'm telling you right here, right now, cut that shit out. <laughs> I, I thought it was more like a desperate emulation of it. Like, oh, I can be this for you, too. Mm, is this what you like? I can be that for you. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> is this what you like? <laughs> is this what you like? Um, so, yeah, so he kidnaps her through a trap door. Um, we go into the down layer. once more slash track down this murderer. Which... <laughs> track down this murderer. <laughs> um, so then, yeah, Raul is following them. He ends up falling. Uh, well, Madame Giri leads him to the entrance of like where to get down to the lair. He mm-hmm. starts to follow them. He falls through a trap door and falls into the water. Um, nearly gets trapped by like this giant great thing, um, but is able to get his way out. And then uh, he's able to find them, but is initially separated from them by, like, a, again, like, portcullis type of thing um, that, like, there's a bunch of them throughout these catacombs. So they, it's, like, separating him from, like, the actual layer layer. So then the Phantom, like, the Phantom and Christine notice him. She starts freaking out a little bit. The Phantom lets him through, but then ties him to the portcullis and puts, like, the noose around his neck. And it's basically, like, threatening Christine, like, telling Christine, like, basically, the only way I'm going to free him is if you marry me. Like, you got to be my girl. You got to say that you're going to be mine, and then I'll let him go, you know? Yeah. And so she then is basically like, ugh, you poor, pitiful creature. The entire world hates you, and I understand that that's why you're such a shitty person. And then she kisses him. And uh, I guess that rewires his brain and he's just like oh i can be a nice guy now i can be chill now because i've experienced the touch of a woman he just masturbated <laughs> he could have just masturbated I, I i beg go find a porn magazine something go find a like, softy it's, drawing it's, <laughs> it's crazy because she likes like i love that it's like oh choose between us is like don't you love me it's like i know i hate you like, like <laughs> It's like, it's not your face. It's because you're a bad person. Yeah. Have you killed multiple people? Have you last in your lust of blood while I now be prey to the lust of flesh? Like, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And so. Do you think I would harm her? Why would I make her pay for your sins? Because you literally have said war onto (laughs) you both. (laughs) Literally. Um, Also, you've kidnapped her multiple times. You've threatened to keep her trapped in your lair and not basically let her see the light of day ever again. And good for Raul. It's just like, hey, I'll be fine. Yeah. But like, I do recognize, like, my life is over either way. Yeah. You're with him. My life's over. I die. My life is over. Yeah. Um, And so Raul is kind of trying to pepper up at this point. So she, so she kisses him. He lets them go. Um, and we see that there is a uh, angry mob coming to find him on their way, uh, led by Meg at the moment. Um, Roel and Christine, like, initially start to kind of leave. Christine comes back and finds him watching the little music box that he has. Um, and Masquerades she... Masquerades the song that's playing. In yes. It. Yes. Um, and she gives him her ring, which at this point is on her finger, but I think it is the engagement ring, isn't it? Um, yeah. And I do, I do find it interesting cinematically how at this point, um, so most of the musical, the Phantom has been in these dark outfits. Like the, the lightest color he's been shown in at this point is red. Mm -hmm. Um, but in this scene, um, he 
is wearing white. He's wearing his like white undershirt um, and then black pants. So he still has like some black in this ensemble, but we're seeing him in white, like as one of his primary colors for like the first time this entire musical. Um, and Christine is also still in white. Um, she's in like her white, like sort of wedding dress thing that he put her in. Um, and so unlike the first scene where like they were coming down through during um, Angel of Music when she was coming through the mirror and he was taking bring her to the lair for the first time when he was black and she was white um, and like these two like diametrically opposing forces of like lightness and goodness and like evil and darkness now we can see that he's been stripped uh, stripped of his like darker layers kind of in a literal and emotional sense um, and we're now seeing his sort of raw purer um still ethically gray area still like moralistically gray um but a little bit more of his true self stripped down and like laid bare um kind of symbolically here which i thought was like a really cool um just note and like something that they were um intentional about yeah um so then, yeah, so then we hear Christine and Raul singing All I Ask of You as they leave together. Um, and <laughs> the Phantom cries out that the music of the night is over as he smashes all of his mirrors. So melodramatic. Like, dude, calm down. And one of the mirrors is a door. It's a door. Um, so then he walks to the door. It, it's a covered in a curtain. So, so he escapes uh, through it, this tunnel. It's a logistic, pragmatic tantrum. Yes. Um, he So he escapes through this tunnel mirror like just before Meg and the rest of the mob discover his lair and would have found him. Um, and so then we the shot like fades on a frame of the monkey music box and that then transitions back to quote unquote present day in 1919. Um, we see the box again is with Raul and he places the music box at Christine's grave. And we see that Christine in this time has died two years prior in 1917. Um, so uh, she's buried in the same cemetery as her father. And we also see that there is a rose there from the phantom with the black uh, ribbon, ribbon wrapped around it. And the ring. And the ring that she had given him. Yeah. And it fades out with the, uh, the rose turning red and everything else is black and white. Which is symbolizing what? I don't. What? What good is that? It's just like I, oh, redemption. Like I. I think it's just visual. I think it's just aesthetic. I don't. <laughs> I, I don't I know. Like I saw. It, I was like, okay, but I don't know. People, listeners, if you if you are passionately for this movie's um, seeing like what that represents and would like to tell us, you can email us at boozicals at g indeed you can com, at boozicals at gmail com. Indeed you can. And so then we see the credits of the movie. Learn to be Lonely by Learn Minnie Driver, lonely. Carlotta, mm-hmm. this actress. I like the song. It was I nice. Me too, it's fun. Um, and then Fiend. Fiend. Tis the end of the movie. So getting into our discussion question. Um, so I brought this up briefly before, but I'm. Uh, it's kind of it's slightly two parts. So. I'm interested in your thoughts on the use of rock opera stylings in this musical in general for a setting that would have been in the mid 1800s and kind of leading from that in general, I'm interested in your thoughts on anachronisms in presumably historical, mildly fantastical settings. I liked it here because I think it did a good job showing, I don't know how else they would have shown that he's like, a musical genius dark and different and i got you yeah just like like a visionary in some sense like he he is an artist instead of like a just just a creep so i (laughs) like that and i think i think it's just showing such a harsh dichotomy a harsh juxtaposition to opera yeah that i think that's what makes it really powerful i think that I, I don't know. I just really liked it. And I think it really makes, like, the composition and, like, the music and of Fan of the Opera just, like, really iconic. Because it's, like, if you just, like, read, like, what the plot is, you don't necessarily get those, like, like that harshness. Mm-hmm. 
but like when you listen to it you just like oh there's like a lot of stuff going on yeah and but like there's a lot of like cool opportunities for like i don't know music u- music used music styling used in a very nuanced way yeah yeah, I, I generally agree. I really like how it's used to distinguish him from the other characters. Mm-hmm. And like you said earlier, Phantom of the Opera is not necessarily an opera, but it has operatic styling of music. And I think within that, having the like the range of opera, like they have sort of like almost classic like arias, and then they have like some more like ballad esque songs, and then almost like the closest I could call is like pop opera. Um And then this rock opera. And I think the range of musical stylings, like, I think because Andrew Lloyd Webber is pulling all from the same family, like, they all have general operatic sounds to them. But he uses the styling of them to emphasize different characteristics, characterizations um, of the individual people in the story. Um, and I also think the instrumentation of the song, like, mm-hmm. even though, like, like I said, like it's that drum beat that really gives it that rock opera feel, but all of the other instrumentation is very classic, um, Oboes, orchestra bassoons, pit. Uh, exactly. You know, strings. Yeah. Yes. And so and like, and so even in the parts, in used. yes. And so even in the parts where, Christina singing over it in a very in a much more classically operatic style it still melds well with the music and I think that brings it to like brings it to working together um and I think it's just not it's not so overdone that it fully pulls you out of the setting um and I and I think in general in that sense like if that's how an anachronism is used where like it is used to enhance the story or enhance the characterization in a way that doesn't necessarily completely take you out of the setting i think that's totally fine like i have no problem with like small Mm -hmm. presumable inconsistencies like that well and which is interesting to say that because i wouldn't consider it like a small thing because it's all the time and it's like that's fair expansive parts of it but like i'm i must be the whiskey but i'm having trouble thinking (laughs) about other anachronisms like that in musicals did you have something in mind when you were thinking about Um, this question like maybe uh, for some reason Sweeney Todd is coming to mind of like like the costuming and stuff like that um but also language can be one like I feel like I can't think of the specific example but I know there have been times that we've called out like the particular language that a character used in a in a musical as like that's not necessarily the way a character from this time frame or character that is described to be like this character is described would necessarily say this type of thing um would you say like um what is that one song in Sweeney Todd? Um, not not at the bay. What was by the song? sea? By the sea, when they're in like those like um, swimwear. Mm-hmm. Would that be an example you're kind of thinking of? That, that yeah, took, that took me out of it as well. Like I understand it was like a comedic effect. Yeah, but yeah, that could totally be an example of like what I'm talking about. Like because I could see. Like, in that same sense of, like, this costume is not what someone of this time frame would be wearing type of thing. And it, like, sort of breaking that suspense of disbelief. Um, I could see someone potentially making the same argument about the use of rock opera in any capacity for a story that's meant to be set in the mid-1800s. And so I just kind of wanted to, like, discuss that idea. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, That's something something I'm going to be looking out... Like, be more aware of moving forward. Or, like, oh, sorry. In Wonka, we talked about this a lot. Like, um, like not being able to pinpoint. In Wonka, it's a little bit different because we don't technically know what time frame it's supposed to be happening in. But there's a mix, right, of, like, dialects and accents and, like, costumes and stuff like that where, like, you can't pinpoint down what time frame it's supposed to be happening in. So, like, also that sense of, like so many different elements of things where, like, it's not rooted in a particular time or setting. I Um, think that's actually a problem I had with Moulin Rouge. I I kind of agree. And I think with Moulin Rouge, like, I think for me, like, it depends how fantastical the setting is. Like, Phantom of the Opera is one of those, it's not necessarily fantastical, but it has that little bit of, like, eccentric, almost ethereal vibe to it, where, like, it's, it's so overly romanticized that I think maybe they can get away with a little extra suspension of disbelief. 
Um, and Moulin Rouge is one that I go back and forth on, where it's like it's so clearly fantastical and etherealized and that and... is it okay or yeah, and can't be like is it okay or does it take you out of the story? Because like that is to me, Moulin Rouge is very anachronistic. Like they don't even bother half the time no, to and like I, try. I, mean, I think that's like definitely an intention of it, and it's only yeah. like specific songs that they have that I'm just like, okay, you went too far in this direction. But I think now it's time for Raven's Composer Corner. Yes, it is. Um, okay, so the music of this was, of course, done by Andrew Lloyd Webber, who we discussed on the Cats episode and the Jesus Christ Superstar episode. Um, so feel free to go and listen to those if you want any information specifically on him as a composer and musician. Um, I'm also going to talk about some of the original contributors who were Charles Hart, um, who is like an English lyricist, librettist, and songwriter, born in June 1961. Um, and Richard Stilgo, who is a, an English songwriter, lyricist, musician, and broadcaster, um, born in March of 1943. So both of them contributed to the original stage production of Phantom of the Opera that was then adapted into this film musical. So Charles Hart, um, I only found like a couple of things on both of them, but Charles Hart, uh, fun fact, his grandmother starred in a London stage production of Sondheim's A Little Night Music, which I just thought was really fun. Both of them had family members that were like involved in theater and music um, throughout their lives. So I just thought that was like really cool um, that they were able to have that connection. So he's written for musical theater, opera, film, and broadcast including writing the book and lyrics for a Bend It Like Beckham musical that I was today years old when I found that existed. Um, Incredible. I have not been able to find a version of it available online, but rest assured, the second one is available. You're on the Raven's on Listen, the we are doing it on this podcast. I love Bend It Like Beckham. That was one of my favorite movies growing up. So then Richard Stilgo, um, he wrote the lyrics for Cats and Starlight Express. So he's worked on, he's worked with Angela Weber on a, on a number of projects. Um, and he also... We should do Starlight Express. We should. I've never seen it, but I have the um, album recording from it because uh, Jonathan's mom gave me one of her records that is the soundtrack for Starlight Express. And I very much mm. like it. Um, that and Xanadu we should do. Yeah, that, that would be fun. That, one of like the sort of classics that people talk about a lot. And so Richard also founded the Orpheus Center, which offers performing arts experiences mm. to young people with disabilities, which I thought was really awesome. Um, of I, course, I, like I, Campbell I, and I are I, always yeah. in favor of spreading music education. Um, and so I always want to highlight whenever someone we talk about is also doing that in their work. So then also I want to talk a little bit about the reception of this and the awards that it got um so it did win a critics choice award um uh, which is a little surprising for reasons i'll talk about in a second but it was also nominated for um academy awards and a golden globe awards as well for um like best original song uh best acting best musical or comedy that it unfortunately lost out on but i think it was still received very well by audiences in general um but it did receive sort of like mixed and some very poor reviews from critics, which I thought was interesting given that it won the Critics' Choice Award. Um, but many of the critical uh, reviews of this movie are like 4 out of 10 or like 55%. Um, a lot of critics didn't seem to very much like this, but it's been very popular with audiences in general um, ever since like the initial run, like on Broadway on the stage, but the film as well. Um, like a lot of people that I know that like any musical um like especially a lot of people i know that aren't musical theater people love but like some musicals love phantom of the opera specifically this film version um so i just think that i, I just always think that dichotomy is interesting when something is popular with audiences but not with critics or vice versa um and kind of like mm -hmm. what can lead to that but that's my composer's corner for today so campbell what are we playing? Well, Raven will be playing the violin, and I will be playing the melodica, and we'll be playing the Phantom of Ooh, Opera. Ooh, fun. Because I thought that could be like a fun pseudo organ. Yeah, I think that would definitely work. I think that sound will be interesting. Okay, BRB. <laughs> Yeah. 
I played so many wrong notes. <laughs> that is a okay, because you know what? I played great. Admittedly, I have a far easier melody than you do, but I think if things get too hard, I'm just gonna play your part as well. That, that's totally fine. <laughs> because my part is your part plus chords. Plus chords, yeah. I'm having so much fun playing this. Actually, it's 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 a fun. It's a melody. very fun piece. Yeah. Okay, let's do fifty-three to that repeat one oh nine, like the repeat. I'm with yeah. you. I'm with and you. And then we'll just do the repeat to that. Cool. Sounds good. One, two, one, two, three, four. Can we, sorry, stop. Um, I didn't actually look at what those flats were. Uh, B flat, E flat, A flat, D flat. So that's let's let's just start there. It, yeah. You didn't know, you didn't look what those flats were. Shut up. You knew it was A flat. Shut up. So technically Shut you up. should have known. Shut up. Shut up. <laughs> One, two, three, four. was perfectly in tune but it was it was close enough that i didn't cringe at it well that's good <laughs> so that brings us to the end. the end um i know you said you like you've seen this before you like grew up like watching it a lot of times now in this uh podcaster watching about a bunch of musicals really going through the brain yeah how would you rate this film version I think I would give this an eight. I think there's definitely a lot of like, there's definitely some drawbacks to it. Definitely some things that could be better. Um, but ultimately, I think, d despite the gripes that I did have with some of the vocal performances, I did ultimately really like the vocals in this. Um, I really liked a lot of the cinematography, um, and I, I just liked the story, the the telling of the story in general. Um, and and the music is just fantastic. I think I would give this an eight with minor points docked for like it being a little too long there are definitely some like little cutaways and, and scenes you could have cut um and maybe you could have you know put out for gerard to get some vocal lessons that could have been nice <laughs> okay. what about you so here's my problem mm. i love the music Fair. i love the performances but the phantom of the opera is a groomer the plot i think is so stupid. oh yeah it's kind of bad it doesn't make it's doesn't make any sense and like i know we're just like oh it's supposed to be like fun campy spooky whatever but like so many times it was like distracting i was like why are all of the characters making the wrong decisions <laughs> they are all idiots or you know victims fair two separate things yes want to make that clear so i'm like really struggling out of 10 plot Four out of ten. Oh yeah, the plot's insane. But sometimes I think that can add to the entertainment value. Performances, honestly, like in like eight plus out of ten. Mm. So I guess I'll take the average of that and I'll give it a six out of ten. That's fair. That's fair. But like It's it's crazy I, for sure. I, I was about to say I don't think I was missing much, but that's not true because there's a lot of very talented actors that I've liked for a very long time that I got to see a different side to them, which is like crazy. I didn't know this stuff about them. <laughs> Um, they're just insane. Um, but, and so that was just like, I like had such joy watching that. Like yeah. Emily Rossum. Like I'm like, I loved her so much before, yeah. but like, especially from this, I'm like. Life changing. Top tier. Yeah. Um, so I think overall I'll give it a six, but it's because of Andrew Lloyd Webber. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> Fair. Um, do you have a question for me? Where do you get off? <laughs> How fucking dare you? Yeah, that's my fucking question. Coming at me. I do dare. Acting like you don't even know where I do you dare. can find this podcast. <laughs> I don't fucking know. Fucking prove me wrong. 
prove you wrong, well, yeah. Campbell, you are wrong because exactly. I happen to know that you can find our. <laughs> I have it on good authority that you can find our <laughs> podcast. Heard it on the wind. <laughs> heard, heard it on the grapevine that you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio. Google Podcasts isn't a thing. Google Podcasts isn't a wrong. thing anymore. Dang it! It ended. But you can find us on Apple Podcasts. You can find us on iHeartRadio, on Pandora, you can find us on, Google. on Podbean. You can't find us on Google proper. Um, <laughs> Google proper. Google. <laughs> Google Senior. <laughs> Google the Father. Google the Son. <laughs> Google the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Um, all of those places you can find us, including um, many other sources as well. Um, and when you find us and listen to us, hopefully, as you're doing right now, we hope that you enjoy the experience of listening to us. And if you do, we hope that you reflect that enjoyment in a comment or a rating um, or, you know, like promoting our our podcast. You can rate us five stars if you would like to do so. You can also comment and let us know if there's other, any other musicals you're interested in doing or just any thoughts that you have on the musicals that we've done, feel free to share um, which songs you hated, uh, which songs you would have cut from the musical, how much you hated Gerard Butler's voice during this musical. Um, and what do we say? Oh, yeah. Um, you can also reach out to us at boozicals by email at boozicals at gmail.com. That is B-O-O-Z-I-C-A-L-S. Or... You can follow us on Instagram at Boozicals, and that's where Campbell posts some really fun pictures of us photoshopped into images from the musical. You can also see pictures of the drinks, especially if you're interested in recreating them yourself. This one? This one is fantastic. I highly, highly recommend that you try this drink. Fantastic. Um, I'm sorry. You tried. Um, Fantastic. <laughs> so hard. Fan- yeah. There we go. <laughs> Um, and yeah. Bye. <laughs> bye. <laughs> what an interesting vibe. <laughs> Fitting. <laughs>